All right, we good? Is it coming through yeah. or whatever? All right, that's going. I know some of you. Oh, awesome, thank you, sir. You hit the record button though, right? I did. <laughs> there, you can sample the sound of the seven <laughs> <laughs> and Make a dance remix of that sound. <clears throat> okay, um, good evening everybody. Uh, I'm Joel, I'm gonna give a little intro into using Cypress. The obligatory ego slide. Um, I know most of you, but for those of you who don't, I run a consulting business called South of Jasper. We're based in Sacramento, and we have offices also in the UK. Uh, we do a variety of web and mobile projects, and also do on-site and remote training for a variety of companies. I run a group similar to this one in Sacramento called SAC Interactive, where we have different web mobile talks every month. It's not always one particular thing. It's not always JavaScript or PHP or whatever. It varies from month to month, kind of like the Tracy Dev group meeting does. And uh, years ago in a former life, I used to program video games for a living. I don't do that anymore because it's way too much work for not nearly enough money. Uh, I'm willing to bet, it's a small crowd, but I'm willing to bet everyone here, I probably go to more concerts and buy more vinyl records than any of you do. Evidence of that is my house looks kind of like that. Wow. I'm quite proud of my record collection. So, um, I'm going to do a few, mis a few bits about testing and some misconceptions about testing, and then talk about Cypress and what that is and how you can start using that. Uh, we'll show you some code samples, and I'll run a couple of demos of actually doing a couple things with Cypress so you can follow along with that. And I'll point you toward a couple other resources for getting a little bit more info. So everyone knows they should test their code, right? But, well, what did I do? Uh-oh, did the TV just crash? He's, he's casting to the, to the... Am I getting hacked? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have I bored you really two slides into the dock, sir? Is it that bad that you had to switch to YouTube? I'm talking about nine, nine seconds. All right, well, let's move to the YouTube thing to finish. <laughs> All right. I don't want to make that go away. Uh, the remote right there, for this, uh, I think it's just home or something like that. Little home button in the middle, kind of. Yeah, I think it's your finger's about right there. It's a little house. No? A house, yeah. There you go. Thank you. All right. So everyone knows they should test their code, but sometimes you don't know where you should start with testing it. Do you grab real people from down the hall? Some companies have official QA teams, which are just people that click on things. There's different types of testing, like white box and black box testing. Um, lots of shops don't even know the difference in what those are. Um, often people at companies will say, well, testing is the QA department's job, and while technically that's true, there's no reason to write broken code Everyone benefits when your apps are tested properly. Um, and even if we wrote a bunch of automated tests in something like Cypress, which is what we'll look at, um, that's not like the that's not the technical equivalent of what people used to fear, like with factories becoming automated, and like they're not gonna hire real people to build things in factories anymore because they have <coughs> robots. Testing doesn't work that way. Yes, you can write tests to automate some of the testing things, but that's not going to replace human QA on apps because you can't actually test things like accessibility with a robot. I can't tell if are these colors contrasted enough to where they make sense, or is the audio coming out of the screen reader code audible enough to where a human can actually understand it. I can't write a little JavaScript widget to do that. So it's not like it's a problem where automating your tests are going to really cause people to not have jobs anymore. That's not that kind of thing, but you should have everything tested. Um, in whatever ways you can. Uh, some other uh, thoughts people have on this sometimes is, well, if we write tests, that takes too long and slows us down. We want to get our product out the door soon. Um, it takes too much time to do that. I want to just fix the bug and then push the code up and not write a test. I can click on it myself and that takes less time. Um, that might be true at first when you're first getting into uh, writing tests as part of your development, but as it becomes more of your regular discipline workflow of writing code, You'll just write the tests as you write whatever the features are in your app that you're working on. Uh, there's even a style of writing code called test-driven development where you write the test before you write the code. So you will guarantee to be having, you'll have tests before you even have the code because you start with that first part. Um, I've done that on a couple of projects and I find that in certain things like um, libraries that I want to add features to or like APIs and things like that, writing the test first just lends itself really nicely to mapping out what, I, what the heck I want this library or API to do, so that there are some benefits to doing things like that where you write your test first. 
Um, and writing tests does get easier the more you do it. They'll become quicker. You'll find things you can copy and paste and reuse, and you'll just kind of get in the habit of, oh yeah, I'm writing tests for completing a form on my website. Here's the chunks of code I used to do that, and you'll, um, it really doesn't slow you down once you get into the group of it a little bit more. Um, so that's a typo on that slide that I stole from another talk I did. Uh, so some Cypress misconceptions are, well, it's a testing framework. So that means I have to rewrite my entire app to use some sort of framework in there. Uh, that is not true. You leave all of your code in your app alone as is. Um, testing frameworks are not the same thing as like MVC frameworks. If I had like a legacy JavaScript app and I wanted to turn it into something like Angular or Vue, uh, yes, I would have to take my code and um, recompartmentalize it and shoehorn a bunch of things in different spots so they would be done the <coughs> Angular way or the Vue way or whatever. And the same would be true with like PHP or some sort of other server-side languages. If I had a giant old spaghetti PHP app that I want to turn into something like Laravel, yes, I'd have to change all of my code to do that. But testing frameworks don't live in the same folder as your code for your actual application. They live next to it in a testing folder of some sort. Um, so you can have your code separate from your app. Enter Cypress. Uh, so what's Cypress do? It's a testing tool written entirely in JavaScript. Um, and it tests your app the way real human users would test your application. Uh, so um, it's free and open source. Uh, people are calling it kind of the new Selenium. Selenium is the thing people use to test their sites for a long time, where you could write little automated scripts saying, I go to this URL, I click these buttons, these things happen on the website, and you can save these Selenium um, driver scripts, if you will, to, <clears throat> to run automated tests on your website. Uh, and Selenium worked fine for a long time. Uh, it works okay for like traditional websites, like where you have a request response lifecycle where I click a button and an entire new PHP page or Cold Fusion page or whatever gets drawn top down. If I click another button, an entire new page gets drawn top down. Uh, Selenium worked fine for that. For more modern websites like React and Vue and things like that, where the data and the UI are running in a little more of an asynchronous fashion, um, the Selenium way of doing things falls apart pretty quickly for a variety of reasons. So we needed, and Selenium was written in like 2004, I think. It's not a modern tool. It was time for something else to come in and take the place of that. Uh, so Cypress is that new thing. Um, it is an all things web testing framework, which means it's tech stack agnostic. So you can test uh, anything that runs in a web browser, you can test with Cypress the exact same way, your PHP apps, your Ruby apps, Angular, Svelte, Vue, um, if it runs in a web browser, Seleni uh, Sel Cypress can test it. Um, so you don't have to change your code. You don't have to even configure Cypress to tell it this is an Angular app or this is a PHP app. You just say, here's a URL and here's the stuff I want you to do to that URL. And it goes, okay. And it just renders it and starts clicking in the app and typing things into your form fields just like you would any other um, user on your website. Uh, it is not super hard to install and configure. Um, you have to have Node installed. Most people these days probably have Node installed, so that should be hopefully just kind of a given. Uh, and then you install Cypress, then you can just start typing commands such as Cypress open, and it'll just work. That's that's literally about all you have to do with it. I have a question. Maybe, yes. Maybe you're gonna get to it soon. Um, are there limitations? Like, like uh, the, the thing that's coming to my mind is like the honeypot kind of thing for, for forms, right? prevent bots from filling in certain values. Does this fall victim to it? Well, um, like, you know, are you familiar with the anti-spam kind of stuff? I think it's called a honeypot, is it? Something, something, something like that? Basically, um, will, will it pass through um, the Google's uh, a capture? Will it act like a human or will it act like a bot? Um, that's a good question. It's on the bot. I don't know if I've ever tested a form with it that had the Google capture thing in there. There are. <clears throat> Um, so it'll act, so now I'm thinking about it, uh, the scripts I've seen and dealt with before, it will act like a bot, but you can also write a, a chunk of code to bypass the Google Capture thing to just kind of work around that. Like if there's, um, to use the Google Capture example, like maybe I have um, the sign-in form and then the capture pops up, and if I complete the capture correctly, another div on the page goes from hidden to visible, and that's where the rest of my app gets loaded from. Sure. You can just write code in your Cypress script saying fill in the top part, ignore the capture thing and just jump to this div that's currently marked invisible and you can just write JavaScript saying make it visible and then fill in all the fields and you know you can kind of work around that if you have to. Or, 
or if you're in like a development mode, which is usually what like any testing framework will run in, you could have like an Angular review or whatever you could say, if this is not a production built application, just don't use CAPTCHA so it prevents QA and stuff like that. Yeah, you do it that way too. And that, that's a good point. You probably, um, yeah, if you're on a dev environment, you wouldn't have your CAPTCHA loaded up. Um, typically people run Cypress stuff, yeah, not on production, they run it on their laptops or um, one of the nice things about it is you can run it as part of your continuous integration cycle too. So you'll just make a new build and that build will shoot off to your cloud thing, wherever it is. And as part of that, it'll do a, it'll run the tests in dev mode before it goes live and go from there. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thanks. You don't sound super confident. No, it does. it does. I'm okay. just trying to, because I, I'm not too familiar with these kind of tests. Yeah. So um, it just, that, that was the only thing that came to my mm -hmm. mind. Um, yeah, it sounds like it's, a solid answer. Okay, good. Um, so the way you get started, first, install Node. We already covered that. Um, there are conferences I speak at where people still don't have Node installed. Um, so are I these C sharp developers? Out. No, they're not C sharp developers. I'm not going to dime out who they are. You <laughs> can probably guess. Um, I will say I taught an Angular workshop there six months ago, <laughs> and when I was telling them, I said, okay, the way Angular works is like, you just, you don't write your JavaScript code in line with your you know, PHP or ColdFusion or .NET code anymore, they're separate projects. And then your Angular app just gets JSON, and that's how it knows what data to draw. And three people in the room responded with, what is JSON? So uh, there are still are. developers that don't use Node and that don't stay up to date on things as much as we would all like them to. But So anyway, if you're not, if you are one of those people, no judging, figure out what Node is and install it. I promise it's free and it won't hurt you. <laughs> And then you type that, npm install Cypress. You can, of course, do the global version of that so it copies into one folder on your laptop instead of putting it um, <clears throat> on your machine 10 times for all 10 of your projects. <clears throat> and then when you do that install, you get two things. You get the command line tools, so you can type things like Cypress open and Cypress run to get it to turn on and off and do different script running by your uh, machine. And you also get the Cypress desktop app, which is written in Electron. Um, Electron is another JavaScript tool you can use to build desktop applications. So like you have PhoneGap and Ionic to build mobile apps written purely in JavaScript. You now have Electron that lets you build desktop apps written in JavaScript. And the Cypress app that you use is written in Electron, which is really just JavaScript with a couple of extra bells and whistles. Um, you don't have to touch any of that. Uh, and then when you install that on your machine, you'll get this Cypress folder structure right over here on the left. It's a little bit tiny. Let's see if I can make that bigger. Hey, there we go. Thanks. It's got a handful of uh, folders in it, fixtures, which you can see has JSON files in it. And these are just basically where pieces of data would go um, that you might want to use in your tests. Like you can see I have a profile.json here that's got fake data for what might be a user profile in it. And I've got a users.json, which is just <laughs> JSON with fake user data in it. So this is obviously not a test. These are just fake pieces of data that I might use in my tests to do can, things like Can you get this when you initialize Cypress? Yep. All right. Yeah, it just it automatically creates that Cypress folder and almost everything that I have in here out of the box. You can see I've got one, two, three, four, five, six folders here. Screenshots and videos get created later. These four folders here get created by default um, when you first do uh, install Cypress. You get your picture folder with your fake data in it. <laughs> You get an integration folder, and that's where your tests actually live. You'll spend most of your time in that integration folder when you write your tests. Uh, plugins and support are where your custom commands and your plugin stuff go when you write things that are not a test itself, but other sort of add-on JavaScript that you might want to use in a test. And we'll look at some of that um, in a little bit as well. So that we can run it, you just do npx cypress open. And here I'll run that down here in my command line. So right now I'm in, I'm in a very tiny folder. Um, is that big enough you can read it? Yeah, I can, I can um, see it. Try, try that again. How's that, better? Yeah. All right, so there's our folder. You can see I've got um, not a whole heck of a lot in there right now. I'm gonna go npx, Cypress, open. I keep wanting to spell it Cypress, like the country. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that has caused more than one typo related issue in my <coughs> machine. <clears throat> it doesn't help that one of the guys on my team lives in Cyprus, so I'm spelling the country pretty regularly in my day to day work. If you spell it correctly and you open, it does this where it <clears throat> just runs a little bit of behind the scenes stuff to start up. 
And when you, when you run it, it's all offline, right? Or it, does it connect to some kind of Cypress um, when uh, service? You run it, it is all offline in the free dev mode. There are paid versions you can right. buy that give you like a cloud dashboard thing sure. that um, offers you know fancier bells and whistles and stuff. Yeah. But for everything I'm doing here, I'm running the free open source version. Got it. I'm not logged in. I haven't even made a Cypress account. It's just, yeah. So Got it. If it does any sort of check to the server, it's not for anything <clears throat> other than maybe a health check on see if I have a, a new version of Cypress available or something. Sure. Um, it doesn't usually take this long. What was the scope of the application that you had just created before you Cypressed it? What was the scope? Of yeah, it? like what what was the application that you're trying to run it against? Is there any any application that you created? In this folder? Or is it just an empty HTML file? This folder is basically an, an empty folder with, it's got the demo uh, tests in it that Cypress gives you when you first do npm um, all right. and install it, and that's all. It's got that, and I, I take it back. I've got like two other um, <coughs> items in here too. Can I sure. Create? Why is this? <laughs> uh, this is Q, what did I do? Oh, let me talk to you, Chelsea, real quick. I have an idea. What I did. Are you the wrong path? Hmm? Are you in the wrong path? I don't think so. No, oh, let's go here. That's not the folder I want. I want this one. Okay. Oh, I might not like this plugin that I was fussing with earlier, so we'll comment this one out for now. I might have a typo in there. <laughs> Try it again. If you install Cypress globally, it won't do this. That's true, it won't. Yeah, thank you. Because MPX gets it on the fly, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it so says it caches, I but when oh, it caches, like it that. Okay, got it. It doesn't like that other file. Yeah, I know. I can solve it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's what you did. He sent it to me that way, but oh, I, didn't, okay. I, didn't, I didn't catch it. It doesn't like this part. I had a fake. Uh, service file here that I didn't actually write, and it's complaining that it can't find the big file. It's bad <coughs> that I only just recently learned about MPX. It's pretty sad. No, I mean, no judging. No yeah, judging. Everybody has things they, you know. I mean, the same thing. I, see, I don't think the, I consider stuff like that stuff that you either look, you either use it or you don't, whereas yeah. like it's not a core fundamental language construct. Like, oh, I mean, yeah, if you said you just learned about arrays or for loops, oh, yeah. yeah. I'd be like, dude, we gotta yeah. talk. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so this is the uh, Cypress Electron app that starts up. And you can see it's got this examples folder in here with a bunch of spec.js files in it. And if I go back over here to um, VS Code, you can see over here I have this integration folder with examples in it. You can see how it says action spec, alias spec, assertion spec, and all that down there. And then if I go back to the Cypress um, folder, let me change this back to not being full screen so that it stops flipping through my windows on me. There. All right. So I've got this action no. spec. Um, alias and spec, assertion spec, and all that over here in VS Code, and those are the exact same files that pop up in my I'll Cypress app. The to sign up. So if I go to click on one of these, go to like actionspec.js, it will fire up Chrome, a version of Chrome being controlled by the automated testing software, and you can see I'm not doing anything. It's yeah. just running through that. I'm not touching anything. That's cool. Um, it's going through and running a whole bunch of tests that are in that <clears throat> actionspec.js file without me doing a thing. And over here on the left, you can see these are the different tests that are running as they're going down. It's showing me um, the green check mark at the top is how many tests have passed, and then the X would show me any tests that have failed. And it took about six, 17 and a half seconds for it to completely do that. If I go back here to my app again and click on a different one, you can see there's a little mark there saying we ran that test. I can click on like the files, spec, and it'll do the same thing. Fire up a new Chrome instance, and it'll go through and tear down all of those files, or those tests. Um, in that case, there were only thought four of them at, in that uh, file, and it ran those, and I came back with all um, passes. I could, of course, click this Run All Specs button over here, and it would tear through every single one of these files and just run all the tests in all of those files for me. Um, there's no configuration that I, this is all default stuff, so by default, 
it just looks in that integration folder and see how I have some tests that are right inside the integration folder and then some a bunch of them are in that examples subfolder. Can you zoom in two times? Can I zoom in two times? Oh, maybe just one time. <laughs> Thanks. That. All right. There's a chair up here too. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> I like I like being um, at the head of the table here. <laughs> so it's, uh, you can make as many subfolders as you want under integration to organize your tests however you like. You don't have to configure that. It'll just look for every spec file in that integration folder and subfolders, and it will just run any of them that, that it finds in there and make them available for you. So then there's my tests. Um, you get the idea, there's, uh, you can see in here too, there's the example subfolder, and then there's my tests that I wrote outside of the examples folder. If I click on that one, it's probably going to fail, as it should, yeah, and that's what a fail looks like. So let's say, oh, neither one of these two tests ran, I can see them both there. Um, one of the other nice things about Cypress, let me go back to the first test, and I'll show you this part, not fixtures, examples. So actions, um, each of these it things, it, where it starts to hit and goes to that curly brace down to that closed curly brace, that's one test. And then here's another test, that it, each it block, see that one's really small, that one's really small too, they don't have to be big, and I'll show you what all the syntax for this stuff does in just a minute. This one's got, oh, several tests in here with some other comments, describing other info for you and um, so on. So, so basically, like, each is of it like a mocha chai test kind of thing? It's actually built on top of mocha chai. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so Mocha and Chai and then Cypress lives on top of that. All right, cool. Yep. Um, so each of these type commands are basically typing something into a field on the page. You can see typing um, a fake email address in. You can do um, error commands, move your arrows around, and hit delete keys, and hit all options and all kinds of stuff. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the nice thing about Cypress is, so if I go back to this action spec that we looked at earlier, it runs that. It's going to tear through and run various things. You can see the web page is typing stuff into the browser over here in these boxes in the upper right part. It's actually, that's not me doing anything. It's the test running. <clears throat> and then over here on the left, when it's done, I can click on any of these and it will actually show me what the DOM looked like at that point in time. So before this test ran, we visited this URL. Went off to example.cypress.io slash commands something actions. And that drew this page on the screen. And it was a git request. Um, and I can, it'll show me like which things it went to look for on the page. I can click on any of these and it'll show me a snapshot of what the DOM looked like at that exact point in time, which fields were active or inactive or anything like that that I want. And I can just click through these and see how um, each test was running step by step by step. So if I have to go through and figure out, okay, this test. Looks like it started to run properly, and then about halfway through, something got bored. I can literally click on every little thing that happens inside that. Okay, I clicked on this one item, I clicked on something else, and then clicked on this other thing, and walk through and see what the web page looks like every step of the way, and where the user was hovering or clicking on something. You can compare before and after what the DOM did to that particular um, item. Um, you get really, really detailed with kind of stuff in here, so it's super helpful being able to tell what's happening in your tests. Uh, with that degree of detail. Close, turn that off for now. And then when you quit the Electron app, it shuts down the instance of Google Chrome that it had running as well. And you can see now I'm back to just my regular Google Chrome with my slides in it. So we got all that from just typing npx Cypress open. Fired up the Electron app, which fired up the instance of Chrome for us to run our tests. <clears throat> All of your Cypress commands look like this format. It's cy for Cypress, dot, and then some command that you do. So that's what you'll write for your test is sci dot click or sci dot get this URL or sci dot something or other. Um, Does it actually hold relevance or is it just a name? I think it's short for Cypress. No, I mean the command. Does it, uh, is there, it's, can you name it anything or is it? Oh, the command is kind of just my placeholder for it. It's going to be cy dot and then whatever your command name is. So cy dot click. But I mean, do you later reference that command in like, you know how Gulp or Grunt does things where you have tasks? Do you later reference it somewhere else or is it just picked up? I'm not sure I follow what you're... I, I think it's like an API. So Psy yeah. is a, an object that has yeah. contained right. methods inside of it. All right. What, what he said. Because I, I, I think... Was that what you were going for? Or were you asking maybe, I think so. Because Gulp has the concept of like you name yeah. a command and then you later go in and say, run these commands, almost like functions. And there's, there is yeah. a... 
um, a version of that in Cypress, but that's not what these are. These are, right, got it. These are not commands like run commands. Yeah, okay, they're not negative. These are not commands like run commands. These are um, functions within the Cypress object or methods in the, within sure. the object that just do different things. Mm. Like this, I can say side.git, and just go find, in this case, an HTML button tag somewhere on my page and would give me a macro reference to do something to that button, like find that button and click on it. So I can click and have the button actually react. Got it. Um, and notice how they're all chained together, just like jQuery. Um, you can keep doing that and chain them together in however many levels you need to go. So in this case, go get the button and then click it. And then you can use this should uh, construct, which is really powerful. Those like your assertions in your tests. I'm gonna make sure this thing is true or this thing happened or whatever. So go click a button, and then when that button is clicked, it should have the CSS class is active as part of that element. So I can tell that my CSS got applied properly to whatever the button was that I clicked on my page. Um, so if you're familiar with jQuery, you've got your jQuery selectors like dollar sign, and then you have an ID of an element or tag your class names or whatever. You can place <coughs> the same selectors there where I have button and just go grab whatever the item title you want. And then when you have those side commands with with inside the construct of an actual test, <clears throat> you've got these it blocks, which are the BDD test style layout. Um, you just name or test like. There's actually a function called it, but all it does is basically give you a name for your test. You can put whatever plain text you want up here, so it should log me in. And then I've got a few things that happen within the context of this test. So go visit the URL slash login, so there's a login page on my site. Go find the input button, or the input tag, sorry, that's got the names of the username, and then type in that username into the box, and it will literally type that username into your browser for you. Go find the password and go add that password into the password box. Does anyone watch Scrubs? Ted's password was alligator3 and all of his <laughs> things. Um, and then go find the button with an ID of VTN login and click it. And if that logged me in properly, meaning these are both valid using and passwords and all the mechanisms behind the scenes work, then the path that I'm on now should no longer be logged in. It should be I'm now on the dashboard. I've logged in, I'm at my user dashboard site. And if that all ran properly and my should command said, yep, you should be here and you are, then my test will pass when I get the nice green check mark back when I run it in my Cypress app. And it, Anything in there fail, I'll get, not only will I get the red X in my Cypress app, but the errors are usually fairly intuitive enough to, to, to tell you like why something failed. They tend to be generally useful in some way or another. Can, can it test uh, like JavaScript variables? Like, yeah, it could, yeah, you yeah, could. Right. You could um, so it's not limited to just DOM stuff? No, it's not, you all could right. have it, I guess, um, you have to find a way to get the JavaScript variable in there. But you could do things like run, if you had a service layer that has code and you want to run, just have it return a variable back. You could have it, you could write a test that says run the service layer object or whatever, and then that should return an email address and just write a test that says, you know, variable should equal an email address. You can do things like that, I, but yeah. I think the difficulty there would be closures because it has to be yeah. accessible from the window, right? Um, no, you can, really? you can hook it into the main browser window as well. I wasn't going to get into that level. Well, well, that's what I meant, is that like because of closures, if you're inside of a framework like React or something, and you have a variable inside of a function, unless yeah. if you expose that function to your global or to your window, you wouldn't be able to say, like, browser, you, you wouldn't be able to access that variable because it's locked within a closure. Sure. Please feel free to correct me. Because um, I feel like you would okay, have in to... The, in which part of the app? In the model or in like the view yeah. layer? Like, let's say that I had a React component. And I wanted to test the value of a JavaScript variable inside of that React component. Just inside of the component, just an arbitrary variable that's just in there. Yeah, but it, but I thought that it would because it's inside of a function, it's now locked within that closure, so I'd have to expose that closure. Yeah, you would have to expose yeah. that closure somehow. In order so you have to, to write a thing to. Yeah. So it yeah, to, the variable would have to be visible somehow. So you yeah. have, have to write like a get my variable yeah. method or something yeah. to window dot. Yeah. yeah, you'd have to write. You'd have to do something like that, but. Um, yes, so either do it that way or Service if the layer. variable was, you know, pertained to a thing on the screen, right. like if that variable showed up in a div, you could do it this way and say just go get that div and check that the contents of it contain right. whatever the variable is and do it kind of not in the JavaScript variable level, but at the, here where it showed up on the DOM level, and that would kind of do the same thing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be helpful to have like those <coughs> debugging tools to like display to the browser anyways. Yeah, it's true too. Yes. Um, you can have as many of these it tests, test blocks, in a JS file as you want. Yeah, I've got two of them in here, and they just test opposite things. This is the same one that we had 
on the previous slide, it should log me in. And then I have one that says it should not log me in. Like if I give it a bum password, then it should just keep me on the login page, not put me back on the dashboard. Second test, does my um, good workflow work properly? And then does the error validation saying that was not a good password also work properly? Correct, right, that's the one, combine them together and, um, and things like that. Uh, before each is another construct. So say you've got a bunch of tests that do things. Uh, I'm gonna go back here to my uh, pictures. Yeah, let's put another example. Not pictures, sorry, integration. There's my user one. So here's my login test. Um, or here's a create user test. So I'm on the sign up page. I'm gonna fill in the first name, last name, username and password boxes and create my new user. And click my login button to create my new user. Should be a save button rather, but you get the idea. And then if that worked, then it should kick me over to the welcome page saying, hey, welcome new user, your account was created properly. Thanks for signing up at Workvine or whatever the, the website is. And then I can also do things like go look for a thing on the page with a class of status message, like a div tag on there, and that div should contain the words welcome Nolan if everything did work properly up above like that. The problem with this test would be, how many times can I run that test before it would fail? <laughs> once. Once, because once I create the Nolan Irk user, it's not gonna let me create another Nolan Irk user. I have to find a way to like kill that record out of the database, reset it, and then run the test again. Wait. That's what these before each blocks do. Why? Why would it fail? Because, because are you once I making a request against the database? Yeah, if I save it into a database, yeah. I make a user called Nick or Boy. Oh, you're doing the before each. Well, I am now. Like, I know. I, All right. If the test looks like that, and I create a user called Nolan Erk, yeah. and then I run the test a second time, the test is going to fail because there's already a user in the system called Nolan Erk. But you're not doing any check against the database right there. This is just a test. I'm not going to do checks against the database in here. I'm going to do checks. I'm going to do that in the model layer in my app to make sure that I'm not able to duplicate records in. So, yeah. Because this acts as the user. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So when you oh, hit sign right. up, it does sign up. So it's not going to redirect you to the, the welcome page and it's going to fail, right? Right. It would fail. The first all time right. it would run cor correctly and the second time it would got fail. It, got it. Got it. But I don't have a test here to check to check for the fail. I just have a test to check for the success and the, t the test would fail. But it would run properly the first time on my dev laptop and then I would go, code looks great, ship it to production, <laughs> and then the first time somebody tries to add a duplicate user, the app would bork and it'd be kind of weird. Got it. So no, we can add sense. these before each blocks into our test, let's say before each of the it blocks. So if I had three of these it's that did different user things, before each of them ran, it would run a second task called init db. Um, the before each naming convention is baked into Cypress. That's just the thing you can do before each of these tests run. And then the task part, and that init db goes over here to, is it my plugins? Yeah, so we're going to my plugin folder. So obviously the tests don't know anything about what the app database structure looks like. I would have to have a function in my app somewhere that knows how to reset the database, clear out old records, or seed my database with fake test data, whatever the thing is I needed to do to make sure it runs properly in the tests. So over here in my plugins folder, in my index.js, I can just map over to some folder in my app where I've got code that knows how to manage my app's database. And then I can add this construct down here that I had to comment out earlier because I have a typo somewhere, but we're not going to worry about that. And then it said basically make a task called init db. Over here in this folder, I have a function called init my database that knows how to do things like delete the fake test records I made, reseed the database the way it's supposed to be set up before the test run or anything like that. And then over here in my user spec, I can call that task and say, please go run init db, which is this thing. And that's just basically the abstract way of going from Cypress into business logic in my app to say, reset the database. Um, and yeah, so if I had seven test blocks in this file before it could run seven times once before each of those seven. So it always resets the database to a known quantity. Um, might seem like overkill in sites. It's generally a pretty good practice to do that. I think you'll find not only will you have this phenomenon happen where the test runs fine the first time, but when you run it two, three, and four times, that fails because you forgot to get rid of the fake data. But you might also have cases where tests one, two, and three run fine, but test four fails because test one, two, and three mucked with the database records that test four wanted to have set up a certain way. So it's just better to just reset everything before your tests run 
So it's done. It, it really, I mean, it's the test script too. It's going to take a couple of seconds maybe to do it, depending on how big your database is and how many tests you have. But um, it's worth a little bit of extra work and time and whatever to uh, set things up like this. <clears throat> uh, running the tests. So we saw that a little bit earlier. Before we go, npx Cypress open. Let's take a look at some of those other tests that came with uh, Cypress setup. For examples, everything in this examples folder um, gets generated automatically when you create it, when you um, create Cypress. Let's open the first one, actions. <clears throat> you can see it has a before each block in it. I did not add that. And it's just going to go out and visit a real live URL out on the Cypress website. So I can copy that URL and paste it into my browser. You can see that it is a real page with real div tags and stuff on it. That's what that page looks like. It's got a couple of form fields over here for you to email and password. And then full name and some other stuff down here to do different things too. And you can see there's docs about what the different tests are on here. So we're going to actually test the docs for the tests. Um, go visit that URL and then the rest of the tests on this page know that they're referencing that URL that we were just visiting. So it, it can do remote URLs and not face any kind of force problems? Uh, apparently. Crazy. Yeah. Um, it's just a user. It's just what? It's just a user. Mm. Yeah, it is just a user. Clicking on things. Chrome. It's not. Yeah, it's happening in the browser, oh. so it's not like it's another All server. Right. So then maybe maybe Good. answer this. Can this be done headless? Like, can this be? <coughs> yes, and I'll show you the, the cool All part right. of the headless stuff in just a minute. All Sorry right. to me to cut you off, but I do have a headless thing up here. Got it. Here, yeah. Um, so I can go. Yeah, visit the URL, and then here's my it block to run the test. Go so find. The div or whatever with the class of that on there, and then I can um, type this into that div, and it should have, you know, once it's done typing that in, it should have this value of whatever the email address is in there. You can also use type commands to do things like press your arrow keys and go different places and check things like accessibility with it to a certain degree, anyway. You can test, like, can I go up arrow and down arrow with um, items like that? I can delete items uh, by just doing little um, uh, angle bracket or not angle brackets, um, curly braces. You can type all commands in, so, so you're not just limited to typing, you know, letters and numbers. Uh, and then, whenever you get done daisy chaining your types together, whatever you want typed in the field, you can just put your should commands anywhere to assert, okay, okay does it actually have the value that I wanted to have in such a spot in my app? Go get another item on the screen and then type something in there and do the same thing. And if all of that works correctly, that test will pass. And then you can see some of the tests are rather large with lots of different stuff being typed in, and some of them are a little bit smaller. Go find this div, make sure your focus is in there, so your cursor is in that, maybe it's a, a form element, and then just check to make sure it has certain flags, um, or certain CSS classes applied to it. You can check to make sure different inline CSS elements are set different ways too, if you want to make sure that a box um, not only has the class of error on it, but also to make sure that like the border did in fact get changed to the color red so that it's highlighted as an error for the users. You can check things like that with your CSS, um, within your CSS with a Cypress test. Um, you can see a lot of them, they get pretty similar, like go get this thing and then check it should have this, clear out that box and check it should have something else instead afterward. Go get a thing and then you can find, you know, find items with certain uh, types of text inside them or sorry, type different types of text inside those boxes. Um, there's a really powerful API of these different commands you can do, you know, click in different uh, spots on the screen. You can pass X and Y coordinates in, so not just click on a button, but click on the upper left, upper right corner, um, things like that with presentation. <coughs> you could sort of fake hovering over items, clicking on certain parts of an image. If you had like a weird image map you had to deal with, something like that. Um, All of the uh, tests here are basically the same kind of setup where these are all just, you know, here's the context that I'm testing, here's my before each block that does something, so I can go visit this URL and then check that the navigation is visible in a certain way. Um, so you can do things like test your website in uh, large mode or test it if it's responsive and down for, um, responded down to a smaller UI size for like an iPhone and things like that by just, um, Go find where the nav bar is at and click it so that it goes to the hamburger menu version of your site and things like that if you need to. Um, so 
So rain test in headless mode. So we did npx cypress open, and that opened um, our Cypress app, our Electron Cypress app, and then it opened the web browser so we can physically click on all the tests and see those run. I think we can actually run that, but what the heck? Let us start, and then it will shut down. There we go. Okay, that's fine. That's not fine because that's going to mess up my other one. So let me go back in here and turn off my plugin example. It's not terribly good. All right, and then turn that off. I'm going to close down some of these windows so I don't get confused. Look up here. All right, so fixtures we talked about, that's your fake data for your tests. Integrations, plugins, and support all happen when you install Cypress. See, my screenshots folder is empty. It goes in my videos folder. I'm going to delete those entirely. Delete. Yes. And videos. Yes. All right. So now I'm going to do npx cypress run instead of open. So open turned on our electron app and we physically saw the 40 or so spec tests in there. We can click on them one by one or press that run all button. When I do npx cypress run, it runs cypress in headless mode. So it's going to do the same dealy here, but it's not going to turn on the electron app like we saw before. It's not going to let me physically click everything. What it's going to do instead is it's going to run in headless mode where it's going to go through that folder, find all of my specs, and it's going to sit here, it found 21 spec files, and it's just going to start running all of them here from the command line. Is it using Phantom? Click on anything, I can run a script. What? Is it using Phantom? Is that still a thing? Phantom JS? Is that? I have no idea. I think it's Electron. Even probably the Electron, app is electron offers headless? That would make sense that it's probably Electron doing this. I, I only know that because it said Electron headless. Oh, okay, well, there you go. I didn't, I didn't know Electron had a headless mode. <laughs> I didn't. So it's going through each of my spec files. Uh, it's doing three things here. So it's running the tests. And it shows you the same output of like how long it took to run the test just like it did before. We get the green check marks just like we do to let us know when they're done running. A little bit of metrics about what happened in each file. It's also, come on, where's that? Uh, creating an MP4 file and it's creating a screenshot of each of my tests. So if you ever have a spot where you have users that are like, uh, what, what are these steps you need to do to recreate this test? You know, so I can, how do I recreate wow. the bug that you have? When you run it in headless mode, it will actually rebuild those um, video and screenshot folders that I created, and it's going to give you a recorded video MP4 of every test that it did, of clicking through all the different things and typing the stuff in. So you have physical proof to show the crotchety manager that doesn't believe you, or the weird QA engineer that you know wants to see what you did, or <laughs> marketing, for whatever the people are, they're always like, well, how did you do this? Like, here's an MP4 file of how we did it. Here's evidence of the thing passed, or the thing failed, or whatever. And then they can actually compare what Cypress clicked on to what the other user did and see like, oh, that's why it's different. My email address is longer than yours, or I lied and that's not actually what I clicked on when I told you it's what I clicked on. Or, uh, you know, to solve all those kind of problems that often happen in web development. Um, where's it at, 11? So then I wonder how this passes course then. How do you... I have no idea. Yeah. It's just a browser. I've had certain apps that pass cores with no problem and other apps like cores is a nightmare. won't do it. Angular. <laughs> fails on cores for me more often than I want it to. What's up? Chokes. Yeah. Whereas, <laughs> is it Vue or React that it's like, yeah. cores, what's cores? I'm just going to do it. It's Vue. Yeah. Vue yeah. is just like, cores is not a thing. Vue yeah. doesn't cores. care about most things. Vue just kind of lets you. Yeah. Um, whereas, yeah, my Angular apps are like, no, I will not run. You have to put Always nine different kinds of fancy Angular. headers in your site before I will behave properly. At, at some point in, in an Angular app, I just add injected cores headers into everything. Oh, I was at a conference with the other co-developer, and we're like, it's been working fine for days now. Why is this cores error happening when I try to talk to the other API? And <laughs> he and I and another presenter, were we were there for hours trying to figure out, why does that app work fine and this app doesn't? And they're not that... Jeez, what's going on here? It was some stupid chorus thing because it was an Angular app, and it, yep. I hate it. All right, so we're on number 19. So it's running all of them, right? It's running all of them. So do you still have the same flexibility to manually say which ones you want to run rather than all of them? Yeah, I could probably all tell right. it, I mean, open this test and do, or do something like that. And then I get this nice little output here where it shows me all of these specs in the examples folder passed, and there's my number of tests in each one, and which ones passed, and anything that were failed or whatever. And then I have my other two tests down here at the bottom that here's the number of tests in those files and which ones failed. And you can see you get a nice UI 
change over there. And I want to see one of those MP4s. What's up? I want to see one of those MP4s. I'm working on it right now for you, sir. <laughs> Cypress. Videos. Look at that. Bam. There's all the MP4s. I'll just pick one. Nice. I'm not touching anything. There's my tests, and it shows me the screen over there if it's doing anything before the test. And they run. It shows you how much time they take. It's the exact same output we got from the Electron app. Can you s describe somewhere in the settings to slow it down so it's not so fast, too? Pro probably, yeah. Most okay. of the things are configurable. All right. um, I haven't tried to configure that, but. So that one we need to prove Nothing somebody. else, you could throw it into like Premiere and just say render out at half the frame rate. <laughs> Upload to YouTube, use the frame Yeah, button. exactly. <laughs> right, so there are ways to do it. Whether they're automated into the headless or not, I don't know for sure. But um, yeah, it gives you all the um, output there of your thing. And there's all my uh, videos in the same folder structure as my tests. You can see how my, here's my videos. It's got an example folder, and then it's set the login and user spec. And before we're not in the example folder, just like my <laughs> tests were. So the folder structures match there and there. And then my screenshots are pretty much the same thing. It has it put everything in its own folder or subfolder. So here's like um, login. Here's each one of my tests. So it should log me in. What does that look like? I get that test out, failed, and here's what a screenshot of that test looks like. Well, whereas a test that passes would be like this one here. And there's all my tests that pass. That's really tiny. There, there's all my tests that passed. And that's what the screenshot looks like in that um, other test. So you can run it with your regular, you know, interactive mode or in headless mode. Um, some things to keep in mind with the two. You don't have to test everything at once. Don't feel like my app has got a thousand pages in it and it's gonna be worthless until we have a thousand and one tests to make sure everything runs properly. Add tests when you add new features that will help bridge the gap over time. But obviously if you have like a giant legacy app that's been around for five years and nobody wrote tests ever, that's gonna be the biggest pain in the neck to test. Um, start somewhere though and just make it a thing that you do. Testing is um, nice because it's not changing code in the app. So like if you have an app where marketing is like we have to push the new version out in time for Christmas, writing 50 tests to test that app in no way changes that code base. So you can just write your tests to find out where the bugs are and are not and do all that like all through the Christmas break when you're not allowed to touch the app's code base and just have a nice set of documentation ready to show here's the things that I know are gonna be broken even though the new version is gonna go out the door anyway or whatever. You can write as many tests as you want. Um, whether it's a legacy app or whether it's something more modern and new, it doesn't matter. Um, obviously, the more well-structured your app is, the easier it is to test, especially when you get into things like unit testing and some other type. This is end-to-end -end testing, so you're testing the app just like a user would be clicking on things in the browser. Um, separate from that, you can test things like individual functions in your app, and those are individual units of code. And um, When you get to that level of testing, that kind of stuff is easier to do if your app is more well-organized. It doesn't have to be a React app, per se, or a fancy front-end framework of some kind, but the fewer files you have that are 8,000 lines long, just procedural <laughs> garbage, the easier it is to test, even if it's just functions, not even in an object or class of some sort. Um, the functions themselves are generally easier to test than giant piles of spaghetti junk are. Um, and then when you write your tests, uh, you can use basically side dot parentheses, you can put anything in the parentheses that you would use for jQuery, so like pound sign and then the ID of an element, or dot and then a class name, or a tag, like we saw the input type equals email like we had on the other example. <clears throat> They'll all work pretty much the same way that would work in your jQuery stuff. Um, it's generally recommended to not use things like CSS classes in your tests, because CSS classes change both as your app is running, you'll add or remove things like hidden or active or inactive CSS classes to items. And also when you do things like swap out Bootstrap and replace it with some other framework, all of your CSS classes will change names then as well. Whereas the tag that is for the user to type their email address into is probably always going to be an input tag with name equals username or something like that. So you can do this starter syntax to go find that particular item. And that generally behaves a little bit more long-term friendly. Um, IDs work about the same way too. I'm probably not going to change the ID of my save button anytime soon. 
but it might go from being a BTN primary bootstrap to being a BTN default bootstrap. And so I don't want to hook into CSS classes to find the elements, hook into IDs or um, go through things that way. Um, the docs are really, really good, docs.cypress.io. The docs for the API are also really, really good. They're, the idea is they want the community to be really um, well supported and make it super easy for people to get up and running to do Cypress. It, it really is that simple. NPM install Cypress and you wait about 10 seconds and then it's there. Um, <clears throat> the docs are really good. Like I said, uh, when I was looking for ideas for this presentation, I went on YouTube and thought, well, let me just see what other people have done on Cypress so far. Uh, and these two YouTube videos are really good. I think they're both, this one is definitely, testing the way it should be, is definitely presented by one of the guys on the Cypress team. And I believe the gentleman that did the Cypress in a nutshell talk is also on the Cypress team. Um, and then of course you can call me if you want to do training or whatever on Cypress and we can put together workshops to teach people how to do all kinds of stuff like that too. Um, but yeah, the docs are amazing. <clears throat> I can show you those real quick. I actually open that up um, here. So you just go to cypress.io and that's the first thing on the page, npm install Cypress. You can download it, you know, traditionally, and you can install it through Yarn and some other stuff too. Um, but if you install it through npm, you're just set up a little bit better for doing things like um, continuous integration, and it's a little more ingrained in your setup in your application, a little more how they expect it to be set up. Uh, and then you've got, you know, writing your first test over here. We'll show you how to do examples of that. There's cute little short videos in here to show how things work and examples of how to write your spec files. Um, the API docs uh, show you all of the docs should and .get and find the different things we wrote in our test. You can see there's a whole mess of functions you can write, um, which is why we did not get into all of them today because we'd be here all night going over all of this stuff. But, it's all the stuff that you kind of expect things. They're all things that your user would do with a machine when they're clicking on your website. And then it's functions to test what happened when they did those things. Like, you know, it should contain this text or that button should have this class on it or this input should have this value. Um, and then it's things like dot end that just lets you link those things together. Click this and click this and fill this in and fill this in and fill this in. And then this div should have these things in it. You can just check that. And all of those are here in the commands um, in the, the, in the uh, Cypress API back end right there, the API part. Um, questions on anything? And that's kind of the gist of Cypress, where you can start with it. We could do this all night and be here forever, but. <laughs> you mentioned two words at the very beginning of this talk that was like white box testing. White box testing and black box testing. Yeah. Um, I know you're making fun of people who didn't know what they <laughs> no, were, but well, what are they? Because I have no clue what they're talking about. The number of QA departments I've dealt with over the years that have not ever heard those terms before is way magic. more than half. Um, so the other black box is you don't know what's inside it. So you don't need to actually look at the code, you just test the thing. So like, I come from the video game world, and so okay. video game testing is usually done as black box testing. Here's a beta version of Call of Duty. You play the game and just tell people, like, level 5 is broken here. Right. But they don't actually have to look at the code and go, level five is broken because this library is throwing this exception and it's memory making right. XYZ thing. Right. Whereas white box testing is one level lower than that. Where like they actually get the libraries of code and you're testing like, okay, here's the function call that happens. Let me write a bunch of tests to see if the arguments going into that function. Okay. All, what if I leave off one of them? Does it still work? What if I put them in the wrong order? Does it still work? So that so. first argument says it's expecting a person's name. Well, what if the person's name is 900 characters long? What does it do? And people that do that, that's white box testing where you can see into the thing and, and test it. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So this would be more white box. Or, uh, you or can do both box. with it because yeah. it's white, it's black box in the sense that you're writing, you're just clicking on the button as a user and the user doesn't know what the code does. Yeah. But I could also drop down and write unit tests and things like that where I say run this function and pass it a 900 character long email address and see if it blows up. You could do both of them with here with this kind of thing if you wanted. So uh, does Cypress have an option to just test a standalone JavaScript file instead of the whole web app? Um, like if I feed just the JavaScript file to the Cypress, will it be will it run a test scanning through the JavaScript file and running a test across it? Um, kind of. So I think 
What the, the pitch they've always told me is if it runs in the browser, you can test it. So okay. you'd have to have, if your JavaScript file, file, if I just went file open in, my, in Chrome and opened the JS file up, it would just, it would run whatever's in that file. Right. So if it, whatever runs in there, Cypress could test if I went to that URL. I've never tried that, because it's straight to a .js file. Oh, no. So basically I have to provide the URL of the JavaScript file. Yeah. In the, uh, yeah, if you went to like, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. um, Yeah, if you went to like uh, here. Um, and change that uh, command to like, like, yeah, to like your js, my, js, like whatever your file is, and then so it's going to visit that URL and load up that thing. <clears throat> that might work. I've never tried it, but yeah, it should. They they always said if it runs in a browser, you can, we can test it. So maybe. Anything else? That's, no? that's great, no one. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Okay. Good. I have some announcements too. Okay. <laughs> so um, next month, which is December, and it's actually in two weeks from now, uh, the next meetup will be on uh, serverless. So we have uh, Merrick Sadowski from IBM coming over. Um, so if I had to guess, I don't know, if I had to guess it's going to be on serverless framework and maybe IBM cloud functions. Oh, that's right. Serverless is a framework, isn't yes. it? It is a framework. That's that's like the standard library for JavaScript. Yeah. Why why would you do this? I don't know. But God. Uh, he's he's really pushing for people to bring their laptops so that way uh, because it's a workshop, so hands on. Uh, so if you're coming to this one in two weeks on the sixth, bring your laptop so that way you can uh, participate. Uh, is this all? Might be. Might be. <laughs> Did you turn off the QuickTime video? No, did you? I didn't, but it's it stopped at 45 minutes and it was already shut down. Oh, don't, don't worry about it. Happened. Just save it. And <laughs> right. I'll take whatever you have. I'll make it work. <laughs> we'll Photoshop the rest yeah. of it. Uh, <laughs> Photoshop it in post. Yeah. Uh, Little stick figures. <laughs> the uh, mailing list, because I'm trying to not rely so heavily on, on meetup.com. I think I've added all of you to the, the email list. I think you're the newest member to the yes. group. Are you on the mailing list? Um, not sure. I do. I'm getting uh, emails for like today's event. I was yeah. getting emails. So I'm guess I am. Yes. All right. What was your name? Jay. Jay. All right. All right. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So definitely uh, use trying to use the mailing list versus meetup.com because they're doing some sketchy stuff lately. Uh, so <laughs> pay attention to the emails that come out. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the Uni Two is having a gaming event for the youth um, New Year's Eve. So yeah, so if you're if you have younger siblings, if you have family members who are interested in, in coming to game on New Year's Eve in here, uh, I have some flyers. Or if you're interested in volunteering um, to help, I'll be here volunteering as well. You can do that as well. If I did not already have plans, I would probably yeah. be down for that. No worries. If you're if you're not doing anything though, <laughs> swing on by, right? Yeah, we'll be here. <laughs> Pizza, play yeah. some games. Do not yeah, fire some. Awesome. I think that's all for me. Do you have yeah. anything else? Um, I think everybody knows who I am, right? I, I just met. Yeah. I just met this gentleman. <laughs> Thank Eric. Um, yeah. Jake. Yeah, Jake. Yes. Um, just, just kind of FYI. I mean, I thank Nick and Nolan um, for just continuing to put these events on. Um, our goal is really to bring the developer network out here, right? To continue to build this. So if you guys have friends or neighbors or anybody who may be interested. And, you know, we were talking earlier about trying to keep it to where people don't feel intimidated about coming out to learn. And so that's one of the goals is just to get even like the younger kids in community out. We do a lot of um, educating in the high schools. We have some classes over at Delta College. Um, and so our goal is to really build up the community uh, of the youth, right, for, for our nonprofit organization. And so, you know, continue to build. If you know some kids, like Nick said, that are coming out, this is kind of a last minute ditch thing, but we wanted to do something to have the kids have some fun. You know, I don't do much at, on New Year's Eve, but probably 
barely make it to midnight. <laughs> so uh, we'll probably have a bunch of energy drinks here uh, on uh, game night, you know, it's till two o'clock. So if you guys know some kids in the community or in the area that want to participate. And then the other thing, if you guys are ever, I know you, most of you guys are kind of far, but if you work, are you local? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is also our, our shared workspace. So if you ever, you know, looking for opportunity to work remote, um, you know, come on down, you know, first day is always free here. So you're welcome. Um, the drug dealer sales pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> first day is always free, right? Why, why go to Starbucks? Come get the free coffee, you know, first time. Uh, you know, the other thing, if you guys, any of you guys starting any uh, new businesses, um, our entrepreneurs or business ideas, you know, every Wednesday we, we're here at, at 12 o'clock and we do an entrepreneur round, ship, uh, round table uh, meet up. Barney's a part of that. Barney is our strategic planner and he helps a lot of businesses grow and scale. Um, in 2020, we're going to do a incubator um, here for entrepreneurs. And so our goal is to be able to build entrepreneurship and help freelancers and organizations or people, individuals trying to start something, build it, right? And ha help them grow it. And also teach them how to go after the funding to get it to scale. And so I don't know if Barney wants to talk uh, uh, briefly about, you know, some sure. of what we do. Um, that would be great. Yeah, uh, the bottom line, what we do with it, it was basically designed for um, for anybody looking to st start a business on it. And we've uh, developed a lot of connections out of the uh, out of San Francisco with people that are key players in the industry, like the Bay Angels, as example, is one of our funding sources. They come and do presentations. So all the parts that you would need to build an app or any basically. Any kind of, can be apply to bricks and mortar, but principally to the technology field on it. We have the ability to bring you in here and show you what to do, how to do it, hook you up with the right people. We do a 12 week course on it. And uh, at the end of that course, if you've done your part of it, which is all the hard part, all the, we tell you how to do it and how to put it together and show you pitch decks and all those kinds of things on it. But we've had, I think out of the first 40 cohorts that we had in our, Four groups. We've got 25 businesses up and running on it. And, uh, they don't have a home run in it yet, but we got a couple of them that are pretty close to it. So uh, we'd love to have you here. And uh, we usually limit the class to about 20 people. We'll probably do it around the probably the last week of January. So there's a little bit of an application process, and and uh, Eric and I and a couple other people are the ones that are going to make the decision who gets in, who doesn't get in. So. We'd love to have you over here. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> a group of some of the best people you'll see in the business. People have done what they say they're going to do on it, not just talk about it. So, love to have you over here. I thought that was great. That was perfect. Just what I was looking for. Plus, <laughs> 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 I get to an app and play the keyboard. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. If, if you have uh, middle school kids, the Mohawkia is a middle school robotics competition at Mountain House High School. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Middle school. Yeah. Okay. Can so, you send me some information on that? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's yeah. open to. That's uh, open for everybody to visit at least. Okay. And it's it's basically part of the first Lego League. Okay. Right, great. Right. Yeah, it's now close to winding down. There are a couple more championships in December. But yeah, the season is almost over for them. Okay. And it's going up to high school. Okay. <laughs> we want to bring some of that major space stuff over here too. As I know you're you're in it real heavy. <laughs> we, we can tell, right? <laughs> We've got, we got March open if you want to volunteer for March. Yeah. Come show us something. Yeah. You're all the way up to March, huh? Yeah, yeah. we're I'm trying That'd to book good. all the way out. So that way everything's planned. Yeah. So I got some shirts too for you guys. Uh, what size you wear? <laughs> 